Okay, thank you, Father Ken. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, a lot of people were brave enough to come back again. I didn't wear you out last night. I'm glad to know that. Um, so we're on page 137 in the prayer book. Let's begin by praying together Psalm 51. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I invite you now to recall or to speak the names of those for whom you wish to pray this morning or those intentions for wish, which you wish to pray. For the people of this parish, for all who've asked our prayers. For those who are sick or recovering from surgery. And so we are bold to say, as Christ has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning once again. You don't have a handout yet. You'll have one. We're going to take a break about halfway through, and you'll have a handout. For, we're going to, we started with a handout, and we're going to end with a handout. So just briefly, is there anybody here today that was not here last night? Oh, very good. Welcome. Thank you. If you want last night's handout, it's at the front door there, okay? Oh, and look, I have one here too, I think. No, but it's on the table. So let's do a real quick recap so that we remind ourselves where we started and that will help us paste this morning, I think, to last night so that it might be a little more seamless. Last night's discussion was about what it means to be human and what it means to be religious. Now obviously everything we're doing, if you'll forgive the phrase, is an extended Switzerism. <laughs> this is how I make sense of it. This is how I interpret the experience of being human and the experience of being religious. <clears throat> and as I said last night, um, you may have different ideas. And some folks had some very challenging and great insights last night that I reflected on and found myself moving my own thinking forward. So I'm grateful for that. People do us a tremendous service when they ask us, you need to, would you rethink that? <laughs> would you let me push back 
a little bit. And these discussions, um, a number of you were with us last night for dinner afterwards, and these discussions continued afterwards. And uh, it's, that, that's how we do the difficult work of thinking well. Think about what academics do. We write papers, we go to conferences, and we present these papers, and then what happens? All hell breaks loose. <laughs> we stand in a lecture room with other people who do what we do, and they say things like, this is profound, you've done a marvelous work, but you're lost when it gets to this. <laughs> you really need to rethink this. You really need to reconsider this. I think you're totally wrong about that. And why are they doing it? To move the truth forward. Right? So we talked about being human and about being religious. So we said that humans are hermeneutes, right? Meaning makers, because we participate in the human need of hermeneutics, interpreting our experience. We said we don't just have experiences, we want to know what those experiences mean. And we do this constantly. This is really, truly at the heart of what it means to be human, I believe. We talked about some of the major questions. What's a good life? What's a fulfilling life? What's a moral life? Why am I here? What should I do with my life? These are meaning-making questions. Not all meaning-making questions are that big. But the really big ones are important to pay attention to. In a, in a way that is intentional. Don't just do it. But think about what you're doing when you do it. Even when you're engaged, at times I'm sure, if you're like me, heatedly in a debate or an argument with someone about something important. Remember, they're doing the same thing you are. <laughs> they're trying to make sense of something they've seen or experienced. And they may be making sense of it in a way that is completely different from how you do it. It may be better than the way you do it, or it may be not as good as the way you do it. <clears throat> One of the biggest questions, of course, and as priests, I know we talk about this a lot with our parishioners, is the question of death. What is the meaning of my death? Fortunately, throughout history, there have been tremendous leaders who've been willing to let people see their death in a very, pos in a very public way. I know a couple of, the, couple of my favorite popes have done that. Uh, it used to be with the papacy that when the pope got sick, you just didn't see him anymore. And then, what's wrong with the pope? Oh, nothing, he's busy. And then two weeks later, he's dead. Uh, pope John the Twenty-Third who died in 19, I think it was 62, and then Pope John Paul II. Um, also, those two popes, it was a very public death. They kept the public informed. They asked for prayers. Here's how the pope is today. So the world ended up sort of waiting and seeing. And, and, and they got an opportunity to see death incorporated publicly into the life of a very public person. Now, we may not all be that excited about our deaths being public, and we may make other choices. But the fact is that people only die once. So for all of us, it's a new experience, and we won't know it till we get there. But what can we learn when we're able to share in the passing of others? I'll make a confession to you. My mother just died. It'll be two years on October 7th. And looking back, I, I preach it, but I didn't do it that well. I was running from her death. And uh, don't ever do that. Don't run from your own death and don't run from the deaths of your loved ones. It is a holy and special moment. And while we don't celebrate it because it's emotionally difficult, it should be cherished, if not celebrated. <clears throat> Speaking of death, have you ever heard the story about the Irishman who moved to the United States to get a really good paying job? And he settled in in a big city. 
And he was doing terrific. He was making good money. He was sending that extra money home to his wife and his kids. And things were looking up. And there was a great neighborhood bar right next door to his apartment. And every day at 5 o'clock, he'd get off work and he'd go to that bar. And he would order three shots of Irish whiskey. And so after a few days, the bartender, who really liked this guy, and the guy liked the bartender, they would get along right. He said, what is it with the three shots of whiskey consistently every day? He said, ah, I've got me two brothers. Me two brothers are back in Ireland, and I miss them so much. So every day I come here, and I drink three shots, one for me and one for each of them. Oh, okay, cool. That's a great way to kind of stay in touch, I guess, emotionally. Yeah, I mean, he only had to walk back to his apartment, right? He didn't have to drive. And a few months went by, and the gentleman came into the bar, and he only ordered two shots of Irish whiskey. And immediately, the bartender went to the waitresses and said, listen, be extra nice to Sean tonight. One of his brothers must have died. Well, why do you say that? He's only drinking two shots of it. Oh. So finally, the bartender got the courage to go over to Sean, and he said, Sean, I'm so sorry about the passing of your brother. He says, oh, no, me brother's is fine. I've given up drinking for Lent. <laughs> you know who told me that joke? Bishop Sage. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. <clears throat> we also talked last night about three organized systems or tools for meaning-making. There may be others. In fact, the challenges of some of you last night, I started making a list of some others. Um, so we said that philosophy is a way, an organized way of making meaning of experience. Religion is another, and culture is one as well. We talked about the similarities between the concerns of philosophy and religion, that they often deal with many of the same questions. We talked about culture and how culture gives us a sense of meaning making for our experiences. Think how if you really put your mind to it, think how tremendously you are influenced by our culture. You don't even, culture is like, if you, if you were a goldfish swimming around in a bowl, you, you would have no idea of what water is, and yet you're alive because of the water. Culture is the same way. Until you become intentional about thinking about it and its messages, you don't even realize you're swimming in your culture's values. <clears throat> And you don't want to take values in ways that are uncritical. That's, that's the real big downside to culture. Often we just adopt the values of our culture. Well, they may be fine. I'm not downplaying the goodness of culture, but they may be not fine. And especially this is important with young people as they are bombarded with value messages every day from their phone, their phone Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they're bombarded. Bam, bam, bam. This is good. This is bad. This is something you should do. This will make you happy. And we really have to empower young people to learn to think critically about those messages. Is that a good message or is that not a good message? All three, philosophy, religion, culture, they can be good and healthy. But not always. And that's why we need to listen critically. A lot of people don't know what that word means. It comes from the Greek word kritikos, meaning able to discern. So when you're being critical, you're not being negative. My wife says that. You're being critical of me. No, actually, I'm not, no. But to be critical means to take a deep, long, discerning look at something. Think about it. Think about it. Is this really what you want to believe? Is this really what you think? Is this really what you ought to say? And where did it come from? <laughs> right? Who gave you that idea? I can tell you that in my life I've been blessed. I'm sure all of you have been. When someone came up and challenged me on something that I just took for granted. Huh? And then I walked away and I thought, I was like, wow, that person is right. Where did I get that idea? Why do I think that? What the heck did I say that for? 
Oh, Lord, yes. He said that, thank you, I want to remember to repeat what people say so everyone knows. He said critical thinking is not taught well, and too many people don't have that skill to be critical thinkers. I was thrilled at dinner last night that so many people continued the conversation. The critical thinking. I'm thinking about what you said, and I have a question. Or I'm thinking about what you said, and I think this applies to here. Right, Bill? <laughs> We love you even if you are a Texas fan. We love you even though you're a Texas fan. <laughs> Especially today. <clears throat> we said that hermeneutics was at the heart of what it means to be human. Now, we have bodily necessities, right? All humans have certain bodily necessities. Food, water, air, shelter. But we're, so we all have those things in common, but we're going a different direction here. We're not talking about physical necessities that we have in common. The reason I love to latch on to hermeneutics so much, I know we all have that in common. Unless you're catatonic, you have that, we have that in, in common. Unless you're brain dead. And I'm not making a joke, it's, the wheels are constantly moving. And perhaps because they're constantly moving, perhaps that's why we often adopt values uncritically. Because it can be tiring, right? After a while, you just say, I don't want to think about this anymore. <laughs> but we desperately need it. Desperately need it. It suggests to me the fact, when I look at something human, and it's universal. Think about that for a minute. There are not many universals when it comes to our shared humanity. I'm talking about truly, in other words, things that every human being participates in or does. There aren't many of those. right? Because most of the time when I start thinking about those, I can find an exception. And the moment I find an exception, it's not universal, right? <laughs> The bodily needs that are universal, food, shelter, air, water, the fact that we all make meaning of our experience, those two things suggest to me something about God. Because, I mean, we all know we're, we're created by God. But when it's a universal gift from God, I, that, for me, raises it a little higher. If it's universe, if God decided every human I make is going to have this characteristic, what do you think that says about God? It says this is a big one for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it speaks to me about the nature of God. There's one for you. So, obviously, God doesn't have bodily needs. But what is it about our bodily needs? They force us to lean on each other. When we're sick, somebody's got to feed us. When we can't go to the bathroom and alone anymore, somebody's got to help us. I know in our American culture, people love to talk about individualism, and I'm not entirely immune to that discussion. But if the day you were born, the day, if the day you were born, somebody put a diaper on your little baby butt and walked away from you and said, have a good life, take care of yourself, where would you be? So those kinds of needs suggest to me <clears throat> the necessity of community. <laughs> In fact, next time somebody t wants to start, a talk, start talking about rugged individualism, say, well, wait a minute. Were those people who settled the West rugged individualists? Oh, yeah, they took care of themselves. Yeah, they had to do a lot of that, but did they set out in one wagon all alone to go to California? 
Well, no, there were lots of them. They knew it was stupid to go alone to California. And what do we see when we look? So we're talking about the importance of community. What do we see when we look at the Christian conception of God? A community. (laughs) God, the one God, we're monotheists, the one God is a community of three persons, suggesting that God, in and of God's self, values community. What do we see when we look at this community? We see one thing for sure, unity, because there's one God, but we see diversity, don't we? The Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Father. The Spirit's not the Son or the Father. So in the Godhead itself, as Christians envision it to be, we see unity in the midst of diversity. Why the heck can't we work a little harder on imitating that as human beings? Well, I I can't tell you how many people I know say, oh, I don't have these members of my family anymore. (laughs) Because one side supports this political person and one side supports this political person and they can't even talk anymore because they have fights at the table over the Thanksgiving turkey. That's such a shame. Such a shame. If we are made in the image and likeness of God, then we need to be thinking about the attributes of God so that we can understand when we see them in ourselves. The need for community and then the need to make meaning suggesting that in some way we are participating in something that God, in and of God's self, does. Something divine. Meaning-making, I would propose, is one of the most human things we can do. Because it's something God shares with us of God's own volition and God's own power. I think it puts us in touch with God. If all humans do it, even people... Now, do people who aren't Christian, do Muslims make meaning? And Hindus? And atheists? Of course they do. They're doing the same thing we are. They're doing it in different ways, but they're doing the same things we are. But if it's true that the hermeneutic skill was given to us by our creator, and if it's true that this is a divine gift that puts us in touch with God, then when people sincerely seek the truth, they're in touch with something divine, even if they're in a different religion or don't believe in God. They may not even know. They didn't make the conference, right? So they don't understand that that they're in touch with God. But we do. We know they're in touch with God. Because we believe that this ability, this hermeneutic skill, was given to them by God. And to exercise it means to participate in something divine. Now, while I said all three, religion, culture, philosophy, all three systems can and do work for people, I personally, you don't have to agree with me, I personally believe that religion has the most components to be the most helpful. In a general sense. Now that is with qualifications. We said some of these last night. If it's healthy, if it's healthy religion, which means people have to be free to make their own decisions in that religion. It means that they have to be allowed to have friends outside that church or outside that religious community. Anytime you see a religious community where the pastor or the religious leader tells people, you don't need friends outside this church or outside this religion, see if you can get your friend to run away fast. That's what cults do. Cults, a lot of people think that cults are characterized by weird beliefs. They may be, but that's not the primary characterization of a cult. Control is the primary characterization of a cult. Okay? 
Even Jesus didn't try to control people. He chastised them. He preached. He invited. But he didn't say, come on, we're all going to move to the monastery in the desert and you're not allowed to talk to your friends anymore. He didn't do that. Another characteristic of healthy religion, it encourages free thinking. Think about it for a second. How does it, the church, I'm talking about healthy churches, I'm, um, churches that value, a lot of churches don't value reasoning. They think reasoning is going to take you away from God. The Episcopal Church values reasoning, Catholics, Orthodox, Methodists, Lutherans. We've institutionalized the freedom to think openly. Who are the institutional free thinkers in these churches? What do we call them? Starts with a T. Theologians. <laughs> and what's the job of a theologian? To figure out where our beliefs came from and could they be refashioned in ways that are better and healthier? So we value free thinking. We've even got a job for it. That's why theologians and bishops sometimes get in trouble. They have different jobs. The bishop's job is to be the preserver of the faith and the unity of the church. The job of the theologian is to go, you're not doing very well with that bishop. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> uh, yeah. That's right. When I was a Roman Catholic, Pope John Paul II came out with what he called the mandatum. Every theologian was supposed to write to their bishop and ask for the bishop to give him or her a letter stating that they were a theologian in union with the church. <laughs> when Archbishop Rohde in Mobile wrote to me and said, you've never requested the mandatum. I said, I don't need it. I got it when I was baptized. <laughs> that made him mad. <laughs> I said, I'll be glad to take it if you want to give it to me, but I'm not going to ask for it. I asked for it. My parents asked for it when they had me baptized as an infant, and I confirmed my commitment when I was confirmed. <clears throat> a healthy community, a healthy religious community, also values the wisdom of the past. It's willing to criticize it, but it values the witness of Scripture, which is the beginning witness. And then it values the tradition, which is the church struggling with what it's inherited. Now, if you've been an Episcopalian and been to a few conferences over time, you may be going, oh, that's the three-legged stool of Richard Hooker. Richard Hooker was a 16th century Anglican pre English priest and theologian. And he said, there are three places where we go to learn about God. Scripture, tradition, and trumpet blare, please. Dum, da, da, dum. Say it louder. Reason. Reason. And what do we reason about? Our experience. Oh, sounds like interpreting our experience to me. Scripture. Tradition, reason. Exactly. That's right, the three-legged stool. That's right. Now, Richard Hooker... Did, who? Good. I, I'm glad. I love Curcio, but now I love it even more. <laughs> yeah. Hooker didn't call it the three-legged stool. He just described it. And people after him said, oh, a stool with three legs. Now, that's creative catechesis. He said, when he goes on Cursillo, they do a skit and say, how is that two-legged stool going to stand up? It can't. It can't. It can't. So you can't... You... The first characteristic of healthy religion or the three places we go to learn about God? Scripture. Scripture, yes. Yeah, well, I, yeah. St. Jerome um, said that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Oh, I love that. And you know, we Episcopalians get accused by some of our fundamentalist brothers and sisters. You people don't love the Bible. What? 
We love it so much, we get four readings every Sunday. How many do you have at your church? <laughs> yes, sir. Discernment is a part of the process of reasoning. Um, yep, yeah, it's, it's a function of reasoning. Here, let me throw something else at you because it might help you as you figure out their relationship. Faith is an act of the reason. Faith is an act of human reasoning. You don't, you, you decide to believe. So it is our reasoning moved by our will that causes us to believe. People come to me sometimes and say, I've lost my faith. And I say, great. And I say that because what's happening is they're growing. People don't lose their faith. That's, it, yeah, it doesn't happen. I mean, if I'm walking down the street in front of Trinity Church in Natchez, and I've lost my keys. That's not what happens when people, they say they lose their faith, but that's not what happens. What happens is this, it's very different. Their faith stops working for them because something has happened or they've learned something that doesn't jive with the faith as they have it at that moment. So the secret is not to walk away from faith. The secret is that wonderful G word, growth. You need to grow up. I remember Father Peter Hammett at St. Joseph's Seminary. He taught me Old Testament my first year. I think it was my first semester at the seminary. Same seminary Father Ken went to. Now, back in those days, remember, he smoked in class. This would be 19, the fall of 1978 when I took the class. And he, he had a six-foot table, and on top of the table, he had one of those little movable podiums. And Father Peter, I'll never forget this, he said something like what I said to you last night about the myth of Adam and Eve in the Old Testament. And oh, phew, that hand shot. What, Father? What, are you saying Adam and Eve is a religious myth? I, I don't understand how a monk could say that, Father. Now he's got his cigarette. And he puts both elbows on that little lectern. And he leans over and he goes, John, you got to grow up. <laughs> so if your faith stops working for you, Now's not the time to leave. It's like now that the market's down, don't sell that stock. <laughs> You're going to take a bath. A blood bath, okay? You've got to grow. You've got to grow. It's almost like someone says, I've lost my faith. It's kind of laziness as far as... Mm. Yeah. Have you been, are you, you, are you a lifelong Episcopalian? Yes and no. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. When the faith you have now, is it, it's the same as if when you were three? Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> that kind of faith wouldn't work for you. And you look at least 28 to me. So, you know, that, it, it, that's not how it works. As, as we have experiences and we begin to realize things about the world, what happens is, people don't like this word, but it's a great word. Our faith has to become more sophisticated. Not stuck up. Sophisticated comes from the Greek word for wisdom. We have to become wiser about our faith. Yes, ma'am. That's got to be fun. Oh, wow. They all the time. Yeah. And Some of my greatest conversations are with atheists. Uh, but every, but I, I, and I don't tell them what to say, and I don't condemn them, and I don't say, but what I can see in him is he rejected the surest faith that he had come to accept without much examination, even as a seminarian and as a priest. Mm -hmm.
That is a great ministry you perform to let him get it off his chest. He's still hurting. He probably will take that pain to his death. And he died for that faith. You know, growth cannot be forced. Can't be. You can lead a horse to water. But your compassion, which is an act of love, a conscious, active commitment not to, this is what I think I need to say, an active, conscious commitment to his well-being, that's love, as Jesus envisions it. So thank you. Deacon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because something's changed in their life, and they're balancing that against mm -hmm. their faith, and sometimes the answer is lots of mm -hmm. When they're probably thinking about it. That's right. Yeah, if they're still thinking about it, it's not gone. <laughs> but they may be causing themselves all sorts of grief. Uh, I mean, the fact that someone would come to someone and say that to them, they must be mourning this loss. They're struggling. Thank you. Yes. Or, when I was a Roman Catholic and finally went to a friend of mine who was an Episcopal priest, and I said, Marshall, you need to listen to me. I, I'm struggling. And he listened to my lifelong sense of being called to be an ordained priest. And, but because I was a Roman Catholic and married, I couldn't. As I told him at dinner last night, as a Roman Catholic, I would go to Mass, and I'd sit in the pew, and it was like I was dating a woman that didn't like me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I had this sense that I was supposed to be doing something that I was told you can't do it. Well, why? Because you're married. Huh? So, you know, it was discernment. Because when I went to Marshall, I said, I'm struggling. You don't know Marshall. He's a southern boy, born and bred. He said, John. You're not struggling. You're discerning. <laughs> and discernment takes time. Discernment is brewing. It's like brewing coffee. I want that coffee. I want it right now. Oh, I forgot to turn the pot on. You start it, and you got to sit your butt down and wait for the coffee. And sometimes discernment takes days, months, years. But when you get there, when the coffee's brewed, ah. <sighs> Yeah, it's real good. It's real good. And in discernment, what makes discernment a little different from just regular reasoning, at least for those of us who believe, is we take our reasoning to God in prayer. Lord, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm hurting about. What should I do? Lead me. Guide me. Show me. Um, another thing about healthy religions, because... We're recapping how, why I say I think religion is the best place to make, healthy religion is the best place, is because of community and fellowship. Now, I'm not denying that America is a, some sort of community in some sense, and that Natchez, I'm not denying that Natchez is a community, but religious, healthy religious communities 
are a particular kind of fellowship where we learn to relate, in the Christian case at least, to God and to each other. And those who find community difficult, you got any people in this? Don't mention any names. You got any people in this church who do? I promise you, you do. <laughs> Every church has got these folks. Okay? There are these folks who, they come for a while and then they, then they avoid the community. And isn't it strange that often in human experience it's the things we need the most that we avoid? Those difficult personalities who can't, just can't seem to get along with everybody else at the church and are always causing commotion, they need the church the most. <laughs> and yet often the commotion causes them to depart. I don't like that big bunch of hypocrites. Yep, that's us. But you know what? We're hypocrites together. And we know we're hypocrites. And we know we're broken. And we know we're sinful. And we know we hurt each other's feelings. But here, we have an opportunity to work through that and apologize and repent. And the, one of the primary acts of the church, according to the Book of Common Prayer, is reconciliation with God and with each other. But somebody hurts my feelings, like, okay, I'm done. I'm out of here. You didn't like the talk to hell with you. <laughs> right? That's what happens. We get our feelings hurt. For God's sake, tell me there's something more important than how I feel today. Please. <laughs> There's got to be. Because feelings come and go. Emotions come and go. You can't be ruled by them. You need discernment. You need critical thinking. And then we talked about those different stages of religious development. We went all the way from a very primitive form of religion, and I mean that in a respectful way, the first form of religion. In fact, it was so, it was so early that some anthropologists don't even call primitive religion religion. They're like, eh, that's not really religion as we think of it. But for our, for our, in our case today, we'll, we'll continue to call it that. We went from there to monotheism. Wow, what a journey it's been. And personally, I think it was God leading us all the way along. How can you explain that happened all around the world? Makes perfect sense to me. And this development, this leading, this God taking us by the nose and pulling us along gradually, I think it goes on all the time. It's still going. Religion will continue to develop. The Episcopal Church will continue to change and develop. Sometimes the, the pendulum, politically and religiously, it goes far, too far one way, and then boom, you have a reaction and the pendulum comes swinging back. Human communities usually find a way. But along the way, if you get trapped in the momentary explosion, then you lose sight of the big picture of that pendulum swing. Absolutely. God reveals. Now, as a theologian and a Christian, I believe that God's strongest and most beautiful revelation of God's self is Scripture. But, every, but God is revealing God's self to us right now. God is moving in you right now. Never stops. And I won't, I won't belabor this point, but some, there are some who say the next stage in hum, human religiousness. I gave you all the stages that Robert Bella presented, but that was a long time ago. And some say we're in the next stage already. And remember, what was the, last, the name of the last one we looked at? Modern religion. Yeah, some people say the next stage we've already started is called postmodern religion. And postmodern, it's really quite fascinating. It has its ups and its downs. But postmodernism and postmodern religion is marked by a rejection of master narratives. Master narratives. So, you're a Christian. The story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's a master narrative. Because it teaches us we should do what? Love our neighbor, care for our neighbor who's injured and can't care for themselves. That's a master narrative for Christians. 
because it applies always, everywhere, and at all times. Boom. Sometimes theologians call it a meta-narrative. So the postmoderns say, okay, that's a master narrative, but it's only, it only applies to Christians. It does not apply to the rest of the world. Christians, because you find it where? In the Christian tradition. It's called what? Vision logic. Vision logic. Okay. All right. Um, now, here's, here's, here's the weakness of this postmodern approach. What I just shared with you is their master narrative. Well, and that, which means it only applies to them. So it's self criticism. Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, yes. Most religions do. Okay, so the postmoderns would say the Good Samaritan story only applies to Christians. But as far as Muslims have their own stories that say they should help other people, including the poor, those would be their master narratives. See? So... In other words, where the story comes from determines who is affected by it. Only those people who produced it should be bound to it. But that's not what modernity says, right? Remember last night we talked, modernity says there's one ultimate truth, and those truths are in competition, right? From a modern point of view, the Buddhists are competing with the Christians, and the Christians are competing with the Muslims, and the Muslims are competing with the Jews, and the Jews are competing with the Sikhs, and only one of us is right. <laughs> But the postmoderns say, no, you're probably all right and you're probably all wrong and just do whatever works for you because of your master narrative. So there we are. That's postmodern religion. Um, and what we're going to do today, in a few minutes we're going to take our break, about a little less, about seven or eight minutes to ten, is that where we are? We'll take a break, 10 or, or shortly there. What I want to do now, today, is to move the discussion forward. Last, last night, we talked about what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be religious? We determine that religion develops, and then it can be a very powerful place to make meaning, human meaning. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be Christian and what it means to be Episcopalian. Does anybody... So far, want to throw out some more? I love the feedback. Thank you. Does anybody want to throw out any other challenges or questions before we get into that? Yes, Carolyn? Um, Which part? That's right, major things. And I am a great respecter of, say, in fact, some people call it sacred tradition. We have sacred scripture, and we have sacred tradition, and then I would argue that God moving in us, helping us discern, would be sacred reasoning. <laughs> these are all sacred because we find God in these realities. Now, I didn't say I buy in all, to all of the postmodern thinking. I just was sharing with you, because that's where our people, that's where our young people are today. They are all over this. You know, well, you know, that's your truth. <laughs> I've had people tell me that. You know, well, well Christians have, well, great, I'm, we're so glad we got Christians, but what you say doesn't apply to everybody except the Christians. And I, I'm going to do more with this, as you ask. Thank you. I asked you to remind me when I forgot. Go ahead. I'm listening to you, sir. You believe that? Or you say you've heard that? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad you don't believe it. It's very common to find what we call the golden rule in other religions, yeah. 
But that doesn't mean we're all the same. I'm not comfortable with the idea that all religions are the same. I think it's, it's more accurate and a little more sophisticated to say that there are many commonalities across the different world religions. Yes, sir. Yeah. There's a lot in what you're saying uh, that I agree with. I, I just might nuance it a little bit differently. Um, one thing I know, we have a lot of the same questions. But we find a lot of different answers to those questions. But they, they share commonalities, right? You certainly are right about that, no question. All the way back to the second or third century, there was a Christian theologian named Justin Martyr. You can love this. Justin Martyr, because he was a martyr for the faith. So they put the two words together and they use it like a last name, Justin Martyr. Like Bob Carpenter, you know how last names got started. Somebody was a carpenter and they put that on his name. So Justin Martyr knew he had read and heard from people about Buddhists and Hindus in India. And he heard about their holy lives. And he heard about how they treated one another. And he heard about the things they believed. You know what he said? He said there is a ray of God's eternal truth shining in the holy men of these religions. Absolutely. But people don't realize we Christians have been talking like this for a long time. They think, oh, this is all new. No, it ain't. We've been dealing with other religions for the whole time we existed. Yeah. And Exactly, and I hope one of the things you've noticed last night and today is that when I do reference people of other religions, I try to speak as if there's a few of them in the room so that they couldn't take any offense. I speak of the brothers and sisters of this religion um, because there's holiness and goodness in these folks. Um, so back to Carolyn's question. So... Scripture, tradition, scripture is the founding witness. It carries a particular, I know I keep using this word, it, it carries a constitutive level of revelation. Okay. In other words, scripture constitutes something very special and very much cherished to the church in God's self-revelation. There is nothing equal to scripture, nothing. Never will be can't be, because God spoke in a very unique and definitive way in Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that we always have to interpret it in a fundamentalist way. There is, just like every kind of writing, there are different ways to write, and we have to read different kinds of writing in different ways to get the true point. Okay? So there's history in the Bible, there's poetry in the Bible, there are erotic stories in the Bible, there are religious myths in the Bible, okay? But it's all God's revelation, and one of the jobs of um, clergy and theologians is to help us struggle with that. Clergy and theologians, and many of those theologians are lay people, so this does not belong only to the clergy. All right, so that's scripture. Now, what do we have to do with Scripture to live it? We've got to struggle with it. We've got to discern about it. Right? We've got to make meaning of it. We have to apply hermeneutic principles to Scripture. That constitutes tradition. Centuries of the church struggling with God's revelation. That's tradition. 
Okay, Yaroslav Pelikan was a Lutheran theologian. At the end of his life, he became Orthodox, but most of his life, he was Lutheran. You're going to love this quote. He said, there's a difference between tradition and traditionalism. He said, tradition is the living, Bill, you're going to love this. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Well, we've always done it this way. That's, yeah, that's dead. There's nothing living there. Um, Father Ken and I yesterday were talking about a vestment that some of the ultra-conservative Catholic and a few Episcopalian priests wear. It began, uh, you know the purificator that we wipe the chalice with? Well, it began as a napkin to wipe the chalice. And then somewhere along the way, some member of the clergy decided, oh, let's make it the same color. Let's embroider it and put trim on it, make it the same color as the vestments. And they hung it on their wrists so they could access it when they needed it. Well, eventually, you know what happened, right? Eventually, it just became something you hang on your wrist with no purpose whatsoever. That's traditionalism. <laughs> Tradition is the ability to go to what is truly important. Now, I live on the Gulf Coast, and we occasionally have to pull our boats out of the water, and we have to scrape the barnacles off. Occasionally, we have to do that in the church, too. We lose sight of the center focus of the teaching, and we let barnacles grow on the church's teaching, and so we have to clean the, clean the bottom of the boat off. But the goal is not to reject tradition or scripture, but to cherish them both and make them alive. Keep them going. Okay? And then the third, of course, was reason. There you go. There's how God speaks to us from, that's one particular way of understanding the sources. We call them the sources for revelation. So as you are struggling with this, God speaks to you. As you are struggling with this, God speaks to you. For the Christian, everything's spiritual. For the Christian, everything is about life in Jesus Christ. Everything. Or as we theologians say, we go to the library and we point to the library and say, it's all theology. <laughs> because what is it? We're, as members of the baptismal priesthood, and even Father Ken and I are mi still members of that, we're supposed to sacrifice what? our lives for the good of the world in the name of Jesus Christ. So everything we do should be informed and should be discerned and should be an expression of God. Now we get off, we get off the path, but here we have it. Here we have a place to come back and say, I got off the path. I need to get right back on the right path. I need to come hang out with you folks again and remind myself what it means to be good and holy and Christian. Okay, let's take a break. Move on. Well, super. So let's uh, talk some more about what it, let's finish up what it means to be Christian. I think I did. Got a green light. Can you hear me? I probably bumped it. Uh, is that better? Great. Uh, so just briefly, we'll finish up what does it mean to be Christian and talk some more about, or talk about what it means to be Episcopalian. So religious people, construct and discover, okay? We discover things, but we also construct. We take what we discover and we put it all together. And the way you put it together as a package might be a little different from the way I put it together. So religious people construct, discover and construct their meaning-making parameters around the meta-narratives that we were talking about, okay? Meta-narratives, those really big meaning-making stories. And all religions have different meta-narratives. Buddhists have their meta-narratives. Listen, all religions propose that the world has a problem. 
And then they say the solution to the problem is this. So the Buddhists tell us we don't have any conception about the true nature of the experience here. And so their meta-narratives point them toward enlightenment. They say that's the solution. The problem is we don't understand reality. Listen to us and we'll tell you how to understand reality and so you will be enlightened. In the Hindu faith, they say the problem is the cycle of rebirth. You keep getting born and born and born and born. In between you die. So the answer is to listen to our mythologies to be liberated from this cycle and reach. Both Buddhists and Hindus call it nirvana. Be liberated. Islam says the problem is our disobedience. We won't submit to God. And that's what Allah means. Allah just means the God. Um, so their meta narratives say submit to God. Judaism says the problem is our lack of faithfulness to God. And so the, the meta narratives of Judaism. Talk about being faithful to God. Christianity proposes, now remember, we're an offshoot from Judaism. So Christianity begins, the first Christians were Jews. And never forget this, when you read the Gospels or hear it proclaimed at church, and Jesus is arguing, or the first disciples or the apostles are arguing with Jews, it's not Jew versus Christian. It's one kind of Jew arguing with another kind of Jew. Okay? It's going to take a little time before it becomes Christian and Jew. Now, the Christian master narrative. Okay? The Christian meta narrative revolves around what I might call the Jesus story. God becomes incarnate, ministers in our midst, suffers, dies, and is resurrected. The Jesus story emerges from the Abraham and Moses story. Okay? That's the story of Judaism. The Abraham and Moses story what the Jews might also call the coming of the law story. We change it and call it the coming of Jesus story. But they're intimately connected. Okay? And we need to understand this intimate connection and how the two stories, the story of Abraham and Moses, is different from the story of Jesus. How the coming of the law is different from the coming of Jesus. They're hinged. Just like that. But they're different. Okay, you can put a door on a hinge, but you've got two different sides to the door, don't you? And those two sides can be the same. Painted blue. Or they can be very different. The outside of the door, you might want it very different from the inside of your door. Is your front door red? Church house looks like that. All right. Now, what's, what's, what's the difference to the two sides of the door? The difference is that when it comes to the coming of the law, when it comes to the story of Abraham and Moses, and the prophets and the lawgiver, Moses, giving the law to the Jews, it was not faithfully kept. What's the, f I always used to laugh. I mean no disrespect if you were a teacher. But I, I, I sometimes would laugh when teachers would start the first day of school and point to the rules, right? I did it when I was a junior and senior high school teacher. I did it for about two years. And then I said, I'm not doing that. I'll find another way to enforce rules and to educate about the rules. But what's the first thing that can happen when you put the rule up? Somebody can break. <laughs> That's the problem with rules, right? Now, I'm not saying we don't need rules. I'm not saying we don't need laws. But the problem with rules and laws is that they are often 
knowing human proclivities? They're usually broken, aren't they? <clears throat> and we, we get upset sometimes when the rules are broken. When I was a junior and senior high school teacher, I, I tried to enforce the rules. <clears throat> I tried to find healthy ways to inform and enforce. <clears throat> I, uh, I had a nickname. One day, one, it was an all-girls school in Bay St. Louis. I was a Roman Catholic, and it was a Catholic school called Our Lady Academy back in the 90s. And one day, one of the girls came to me and said, Mr. Switzer, someone wrote something bad about you in the restroom. I said, really? What did it say? I can't say it. I said, go get all the girls out. Okay, so she runs everybody out. I knocked on her door. Is everybody out of the restroom? Nothing happened. So I walk in, and I'm looking around, and there inside, there was only one stall, there inside of the stall, written in dark blue ink, were the words, Mr. Switzer is a balding bastard. <laughs> I had to give him credit for being poetic. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think, okay, I've angered somebody by enforcing some rule or being critical about what they were doing. Christianity, now this is, I'm taking this straight from St. Paul. So it's very Pauline, okay? Christianity comes along and Paul teaches us that since we cannot adequately, certainly not perfectly, keep the laws of Moses, the law of Moses, and what's the long version of that. Since we cannot perfectly or even adequately love and serve God, we got a problem, right? If the heart of your religion is do this, don't do this. If that's the heart and soul of your religion and you're finding it, some people find it impossible, others find it difficult to keep that, we in a heap of trouble. And you've broken it. And you've broken it. Yeah. There were, of course, rituals uh, for forgiveness from the Jewish God, from God, our God. We worship the same God that they do. So Paul says, God is looking at this. And while Scripture, the Old Testament, does occasionally speak of God's anger, fairly often, actually, in God's disappointment and God's punishment and the terrible things that are going to happen as punishment. But ultimately, God does something even better than punishing us. God has mercy on us. And he sends his son, Jesus. Jesus is different from us. Somebody asked last night about, is he the perfect Person. Absolutely, that's the point. Jesus is perfectly faithful to God's will. Okay? And he's also what? Fully human. 100% 100% human, 100% divine. Now, I know this is old this is theology that some people say that's old stuff, the church needs to move on. I will die if we ever leave. I would have to leave. I cannot be a member. You know how long it took me to study the Episcopal faith before I realized, okay, I can join this church. <laughs> if we ever abandon this teaching, it, would not, it wouldn't be church to me anymore. So Jesus is perfectly faithful to God. You can call him sinless too. But what I want to emphasize is his perfection in doing God's will. Now, well, what does that do for me? I'm not Jesus, <laughs> right? So how does that change you? It changes you because his perfection and his faithfulness is imputed. That's a lovely word. Is imputed, which just means assigned to us. Those of us who join with Jesus and are baptized... That baptism is a ritual that incorporates us into the body of Christ. We are one body now. 
And can Jesus leave his body behind? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay? So what he has accomplished, not only is his, but ours as well. You know that wonderful place in Romans where Paul talks about we're saved by faith? He says, we are saved by faith in Christ. Here's the cool thing. In the original Greek, it means two things, actually. It means we are saved by faith in Christ, but it also means we are saved by the faith of Christ. I love that. I love that. My faith ain't strong enough. I don't know about you. You ever worry? I don't think I have strong enough faith. Well, guess what? You don't. I don't either. Your salvation is not contingent upon whether or not you got strong enough faith. Because then it would be a religion of earning salvation, wouldn't it? See? It's the perfect faith of Jesus Christ that is our salvation. And when we speak of our faith, it is our faith in him that he will give to us the rewards of what he accomplished, not what I accomplished, what he accomplished. Christianity is not a religion of earning anything. Christianity is a religion of abandonment. Abandon yourself to the Savior in all of your broken humanness, in all of your sinfulness, give yourself to Christ. And the ritual for that, the ritual moment in the church is baptism. I don't want to stir anything up, make anybody mad, but if you read the Mississippi Episcopalian, you will know that recently in those pages, I took the stand that the church should not change the requirement to be baptized to go to communion. This is the point. This is why. This is not just a table. It's an altar on which you're supposed to sacrifice your life. This is not just a fun thing. Oh, let's go to church and get the cookie. This is damned serious stuff. Now, are there pastoral times when a priest has to make a decision? Yeah. I have some children in my parish. Ever since I got there five years ago, they've gone to communion, and I only recently realized they're not baptized. We'll get there. So I would never yank it away. At this point, I can't, I've been doing it for years. I can't yank it away from them. So yeah, there's exceptions. That's called pastoral necessity. But I don't want to change the rule because I don't want it to be easy to go to communion. I want people to have to give themselves to Jesus Christ. I want them to be part of the body of Christ. I want them to do their best to follow Christ. And we commit ourselves to that at baptism. And then we renew it every time we go to communion. But we can't renew what we never committed to. <laughs> so the word imputed means also, it comes from Latin, it means to settle an account. Our account has been settled with God and it's been settled by Christ. Now there are multiple significant salvific moments in the ministry of Christ. Special moments where we point to and says, ah, that's the essence of what he has accomplished for us. The incarnation is one. That's his birth. His crucifixion is death. And then everything in between, right? This is where Christ accomplishes his work. And it... Uh, there was a second century theologian named Tertullian. Remember him from... Seminary. Tertullian put so much emphasis on the crucifixion and the church picked up on it, the death of Jesus, that at times we're so engrossed in his death and resurrection we forget the importance of, John and I were just talking about it, the incarnation. God became human. The gap between humans and God is gone. 
What did, according to the Acts of the Apostles, what did the first Christian martyr see when he looked up as they were about to stone him? Stephen, remember Stephen? They're about to, they're angry, they're gathered around. He looks up, he says, I see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. Why is that important? He is us. Humanity is at the right hand of God. How can God say, I'm destroying all of humanity because they're so evil and wrong? Well, not you, Jesus, because you're perfect. Okay? What he accomplished and what he represents next to God's throne is what has been granted, given to us, and what we can expect in the long term. It's all meaning making, folks. Yeah, I'm okay with that. That's just one way. To, there are many ways we can speak of it. Some people might think it's not strong enough language. Uh, we speak of him as being, as I said, fully human, fully divine, but there are plenty of ways to speak. Yeah, he's the manifestation of God. But he's a manifestation of God in perfect unity with humanity. So in some sense, he's a, he's a manifestation of humanity. And those two manifestations come together in one beautiful Savior. Now, talking about this, these salvific moments in the life of Christ. We've got to talk about one thing. I'm going to take a little side trip for a minute because I think it's important. There is a problem in Christianity, and I use that word in a technical sense. Oh, there's multiple. Theologians love to find the problems. The technical meaning of a problem is something that has to be solved. And the death of Jesus is a problem in Christianity the way it's understood by some Christians. Oh, and I've had, I've had some Christians, not too often in the Episcopal Church, because as I said, biblical fundamentalism just doesn't sit well. I know some Episcopalians who pretty much are biblical fundamentalists, but it doesn't sit well with the way that we think of God speaking to us, right? We, we Episcopalians are usually pretty comfortable with the notion that there's figurative and symbolic language in Scripture. There are exceptions, but... So, it is not unusual for me to hear Christians... Say, God sent Jesus to die. God sent Jesus to die. God needed Jesus to die. It's usually wrapped up in that very bloody language. Our sins are cured by the blood of Christ. I even heard a preacher one time in a Bible church preaching this. I was visiting, don't remember where or when, years ago. And he said, when God looks at you, because you're a Christian, God doesn't see your sins. He looks through the blood of Jesus. And when God looks through the blood of Jesus, the sins are gone. So you can come on in. I'm not real comfortable with that language, and I don't think it's biblical. I don't think it's as much as our fundamentalist brothers and sisters love to tell me that we're faithful to the Bible, I'm like, not always, no. <laughs> and when I read Scripture, I don't... It does not seem to me that Scripture says God sent Jesus to die. I'll tell you what one of my theology professors told me at Loyola University years ago, we were on a break like we just had. And we were sipping coffee out in the courtyard in Loyola of the Liberal Arts Building. And we had, it was a course on Christology. We'd been talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I said, Father Duffy, why did Jesus have to die? And in his eternal wisdom, God rest his soul now, in his eternal wisdom, he said, John, Jesus didn't have to die. God sent him and we killed him. Boom. Big growth moment for me. 
I struggled with it for the longest term, the longest time. And yet, the more I read Scripture looking for the answer, I think he was right. God sent Jesus. A sinful humanity killed him. He was inconvenient. He was the inconvenient truth. <laughs> okay? An unjust regime took care of it in cooperation with some of the ruling religious elite. Some. Okay? I don't think it's right to blame the Jews for the death of Jesus. Certainly like no Jew alive today had anything to do with it. Okay? God sent him and humanity killed him. So this faithfulness that our salvation rests upon is the faithfulness of Jesus to fulfill the mission given to him by the Father. Go and announce my message. Go and give good news. And the son said, yes, Father, I will go. Yes, I will go. And when he got here, he fulfilled the command, go and speak, go and teach, go and announce. And when people said, shh, they're going to get you. He said, I got to do what I was told to do. And when they said, shh, they'll kill you. He said, I got to do what I came to do. Perfect obedience. And then finally, they got tired of him. And they wiped him out. And that is what saves us. And of course, it runs through all of the rest of it too. The incarnation is part of that. Death and resurrection is part of that. I can't say I know that alternative because that's not what happened. The story was written about what happened. Uh, there may be any number. I don't know since I'm not God and you're not God. We don't know what other alternate plans God had. But what we do know is that he was faithful. And let me tell you why I say that. Why this bothered me and was troubling to me. We need to be careful about what we say God wants from us. And what God wills. Let me let you in on another secret. You don't know what God wants. You don't know what God wills. You don't know what God desires. Now before you throw stones. We're going to avoid heresy. I saw, I saw his eyes. It was kind of like what? Then what are we doing here? What we do know. Is what scripture tells us. God wants. And God wills and God desires. And what we do know is what the church has done with that in sacred tradition, sacred scripture, sacred tradition. And so we use our reasoning to be faithful to this. And we, we believe that these things are true and accurate. So there's my putting that little bit of space between what God wants and how we learn what God wants, I think it's an important bit of space because it keeps us from being triumphalistic. I know you don't. <laughs> Jesus certainly knew what God wanted and he was faithful to it. And the reason I think it's important is when we say things about God, we, we need to be very careful because if you say to me, God wanted, or even stronger, he required the death of Jesus. All right, well, what if, what if Father Ken, we dismiss, and he goes off first because he's got something important to do in his office, and when he gets to the door, he sees a man with a knife right around the corner, and he knows whoever goes first is going to get a knife in the neck and probably die. So he comes in and goes, John, that was rude of me. You're the guest of honor. You go. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Yeah. 
What are the alternatives? Now, I think we're probably agreed that that was immoral. What he should do is probably slam and lock the door and say, everybody get out the front door. Right? So why is it too much different to say God sent Jesus to do this? I don't have the answers to the other part. But I'm much more comfortable. And the more I read scripture, the more I think I'm onto something. And that Father Duffy... That man touched me so deeply in terms of what he taught me. When he died, I was sitting at my desk at Spring Hill and my computer went ding. And I opened an email, official email from Loyola University and said, we are sorry to announce that Father Steve Duffy has died. It's happening again, but tears began to stream down my face. And I thought, okay, he was a great man, a terrific scholar man of tremendous wisdom, I thought, John, why are you crying? And I realized that it was because of the way he encouraged me to grow. He changed me as a person. He turned me into a scholar. He was the first real professor that taught me something about real scholarship. He used to write on my papers, John, this eludes me. <laughs> yeah, that's because I was in a hurry, Father. <laughs> I might have gotten that a couple of times. I took three courses from Father Duffy, and I didn't get an A until the third course. What was his name? Stephen, with P-H, Duffy, D-U-F-F-Y. I, I wanted to make a pilgrimage to his burial site, and when I called the university, I said, where is Father Duffy going to be buried because I want to visit? I just need to go there. They said, he was a man of scholarship, he donated his body to science to the very last. I remember one night he was running late and he said, oh, sometimes being a priest really gets in the way of being a scholar. <laughs> I guess he'd had a pastoral call or something. <laughs> yeah, John. Oh, I would never. I don't mean thank you. I need to clarify because I knew it up here, but I didn't say it here. <laughs> I am not denying the salvific significance of his death. Okay? No, no, no. His death carries tremendous significance, but so does the incarnation. So does his teaching. So does his resurrection. I'm not trying to lessen his death at all. I'm simply saying that I don't believe Scripture teaches that God required his death. I think that's correct, yes. The cross was. In fact, we have, we're not 100% sure, but there are some markings on the walls of homes in Pompeii that look like they could have Christian crosses when they uncover those. But not crucifixes. Okay. Um, and it's off the shelf. It's like Constantine? You're talking about Constantine? Actually, Constantine, it wasn't the cross so much for Constantine, it was the Cairo. The, the uh, two Greek letters, Chi, which we call X. And then Rho, we call it P, the first two letters of the word Christ. That was what his banners, he had this placed on his banners. Yeah. Well, it's okay because certain writers mistake that. They say it was the cross, it wasn't the cross. Um, that's all. Yeah, yeah, that's right. His mother, Helena, supposedly found the true cross. She had some people digging in Jerusalem and she found the true cross. And so that could be part of the confusion. Oh yeah, because it's, it's the sign that God has conquered death. No, there's no question. I would agree with you on that. Yeah. 
it became much more common after Vatican II. Certainly did, because they wanted to highlight the resurrection. Yeah, I've always loved that vision. He's in front of the cross, but he's resurrected in glory. Yeah. It was not a requirement to take out the crucifix, but it was something that Catholics were encouraged to have this understanding. Uh, don't live in the death. <laughs> Pass through the death and cherish the resurrection. Um, so, all right, well, those are some ideas about being Christian. So, real quickly, what does it mean to be an Episcopalian, which is a particular kind of Christian? Now, I have no problem with people changing churches when they outgrow a church or outgrow a religion. I've got no problem with that, so please don't misinterpret me. But I do struggle at times with people who church hop without, without having any understanding that you're going from this church to this church to this church, and we have some major disagreements on some things. I mean, it took me 30 years to become an Episcopalian, in part because I was studying what it would mean to be an Episcopalian. Um, so, to be an Episcopalian means to be an Anglican, doesn't it? Um, and the word Anglicanism didn't come into existence until the middle of the 1800s. If you read my recent article last month on the gathering of the bishops at Lambeth Conference, um, we are a national church. I think if I remember right, there are 46 Anglican provinces or Anglican churches throughout the world. So the Anglic, there's no such thing as an Anglican church in the global sense. The, it's the Anglican communion, and these 46 churches are members of this communion. And the communion got started because for better or for worse, as the British colonized all around the world, they sent clergy to serve the needs of their, um, their uh, diplomats and their military. And then local people started joining in, and before you know it, you have local expressions of the Church of England. And then with decolonization came the decision, hey, we need to let these churches be their own churches. And so each of these churches is autonomous. The Archbishop of Canterbury serves as the chairman of the board or uh, the chief, whatever you want to call it, but he's, he can't order all the world's churches on what to do. He has a lot of legal authority in the Church of England, but he can't call uh, Bishop Curry, our presiding bishop, and tell him, you, you have to do this. He can put pressure on him, but he can't make him do anything because we are an autonomous church. At the same time, we are also a church that understands itself to be Catholic, universal, and related to everything else in the world. So we are also not only Catholic, but we're Reformed because we took a lot of learning from the Protestant Reformation and put it into place in the church. We're very much, uh, uh, we talk about the, uh, the middle way. Have you heard that? term. In the, it's important in the Anglican understanding of that. So we took a middle way. We, we didn't do things the Roman Catholic way, and we didn't do things the evangelical way. We found the middle way, and we kept the priesthood, and we kept the diaconate, and we kept the bishop. That's why we're called Episcopalians, because the Greek word episkopos means bishop. So we're the bishop church in the United States. So we kept those things that sound very Catholic, and come from the ancient tradition of the church, like the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, okay, respect for the early church councils, we kept those things, but we also introduced some of the reforms of the Protestant Reformation. Father Ken and I are married priests. Sometimes people will ask, what's that ring? Because I'll have my collar on, i got a ring, the checkout girl at Winn-Dixie's like, what's that ring mean? I said, that's because I'm married. What? You're a married priest? I say, yeah, I'm Episcopalian. I'm not Roman Catholic. So that's uh, the emphasis on the priesthood of the baptized. Now, the, Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church never dumped that. They can't dump it. It's in Scripture. But they paid no attention to it for centuries. They were bound by clericalism, which is an excessive emphasis on the clergy. Are clergy important? Heck Yeah. But too much emphasis takes away what you're supposed to be doing. Um, we've already talked about where Anglicans believe we can find God. 
We're also a Eucharistic church. That can't be denied. And we've become more Eucharistic since the reform of the prayer book in 1979. And this is a direct response to the Roman Catholic reforms at the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. Because at Vatican II, there were Protestant observers. And the Protestant observers went back to their church and said, do you know what them Roman Catholics are doing? Oh, that's cool. Maybe we should talk about that. And the Episcopalians got together and said, hey, let's do it. And I know all of you are not lovers of the 79 prayer book, and you adore the 1928. I occasionally use it for morning and evening prayer myself. Um, but one of the things that changed was in the, early in the prayer book, you will find some notes that say, the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is the principal service of this church on Sundays and holy days. Morning prayer, evening prayer, those are important too. And if you've got a big enough parish with people close by, some churches celebrate those together. But on holy days and Sundays, it should be the Holy Eucharist. And when we get together, we dine at two. You have is this for announcements over here? Okay. And that's where the gospel is done. Okay. In a lot of churches, there's one. In my church, we just have one. Um, but you've got two because you want to emphasize the gospel. That's why. The, so, but if you think about it, we eat, not so, we dine at two different tables when we come together on Sunday. First, we crack open the scriptures. Right? We, break, we literally break the book open <laughs> and we hear the word of God. We are fed here by the word of God. And then we go to this table or altar and now we break not a book but bread. And we are fed there. Okay? We are a church that is called to reconciliation. We should be reconciled to God. Jesus makes that possible. We should be reconciled to one another and to the wider world. And we should be reconciled to ourselves. All of us have places inside that we're not happy with. And we need all forms, all those three forms of reconciliation. And God gives us the grace, his presence, and his assistance, that's, we, that's what we said last night, grace is God's presence and assistance, to be reconciled on all of these levels. Now, there's, if you notice, some of this is overlay, right? Some of this says something that's true for all Christians. But what I'm trying to do is highlight the things that are of particular importance in the Episcopal Church. A couple minutes and we'll be done. What we do when we come together for worship <clears throat> as Episcopalians, we do it a little different from many fundamentalist and Bible churches. The pastor says, oh, I'm going to preach on this. And that's what he preaches on. And he picks the scripture reading. We have a lectionary. Dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. Yeah, yeah. We, just because I want to. Because I know it real good. <laughs> but we have a lectionary. We got that tradition from the Jews. They had a lectionary. Still have one. So the community has decided what we will read. And now our lectionary, most of us are using the revised common lectionary. So on any given Sunday, you might find that the Methodists and the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics and the Episcopalians, we all read the same gospel that day. Even some Presbyterian, okay. I think they might do that here, if I remember, but I'm not sure. It's a, it's a wonderful hope for ecumenism. And you get it three times. Same thing. So when we gather together, we are immersing ourselves, not just because this guy wants to preach on this today. We're immersing ourselves in a formation process for that hour or hour and ten minutes where we hear from God, where we 
celebrate together in fellowship with other broken people, where we offer ourselves along with the bread and wine on the table, and God takes the bread and wine, that's called the oblation, and it's given back to us, but in a new way now. It becomes the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. And since we offered ourselves with the bread and wine, God accepts us with the bread and wine and returns us to ourselves with a renewed promise. It's okay. You're forgiven. I'm with you. You can do this. Your sins won't keep you from me. And the whole thing is renewed when we receive Holy Communion. Our sins are forgiven. That process, confessing to God, the absolution spoken by the priest, the receiving of Holy Communion. Now, at the end, one of the options for this service, sometimes we call it Holy Eucharist, sometimes we call it Mass. How do we end the service? The celebrant goes to the back, and what does he do to us? He okay. The word is dismissal. The deacon or priest dismisses us. In Latin, the word mass comes from the word for dismissal in Latin. Now, it's not just a bye. Love y'all. See you next Sunday. This is an important ritual moment, okay? We came in, we gave ourselves and the bread and wine to God. He returned us to ourselves renewed and returned the bread and wine as a sacrament. And now, as we ate and drank the sacrament, now we are dismissed to go be the sacrament for the rest of the world to eat and drink. Go be eaten by the world. Go be drunk by the world. The world needs you. The world needs you to do for it what we did together. The world needs you to speak so that it can hear. The world needs you to be eaten and drunk for its salvation. Matthew 16:25. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's a sacrifice to be eaten by the world. You've got to give up time. You've got to pay attention to people that drive you crazy. <laughs> but that's what we're called to do. So in conclusion, look what we've done since last night. We've come full circle. Humans are meaning makers. Being religious is a way of being human. Being Christian is a way of being human. Being Episcopalian is a way of being human. And the, in the Episcopal Church, if we do it right, we don't always do it right, but it's still, it's still okay. There's still something to be gained even when we don't do it right. In the Episcopal Church, if, if we do it right, this time together here becomes a lab where it's safe to experiment with being human. It becomes a place of fellowship. And that's pluses and minuses. Because when we hang out together, we bless each other with our presence, and we hurt each other with our presence. It's a place of intimacy and mutual support. Some of the people who are staying out of here need it the most because they're hurting. And the fellowship even the hurting each other's feelings can become a blessing if we use it as a way to humbly say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. And if those who have been hurt can be humble enough to say, I accept your apology for the sake of our fellowship in Christ. It becomes a place of forgiveness and reconciling and service, each other, the world. It becomes a place, you ready? It becomes a place where we can laugh at our brokenness and enjoy the belly laugh. We can laugh at our brokenness and rejoice in our forgiveness. One theologian I read said, 
we should all be wearing metaphysical crash helmets when we go to church. Because the biggest issues and problems and things in the human experience are all right in front of us. Love, hate, sex, struggle, difficulty, old age, sickness, dying, rising, living forever. It's all there in Scripture. Love that. If you will, I want to end with the handout, please. This is an ex- some more Switzerism, an extended Switzerism. So, if it is true that, if it is true that we are made in the image and likeness of God, if it is true that we have been gifted into existence by a God of hospitality, if it is true that God is a perfectly unified community of co-equal, co-eternal divine persons, If it is true that we are made for relationships that are modeled on the divine community, the Trinity, if it is true that none of us could have made it to this point alone, if it is true that our very humanity is constituted by the need to make meaning of our existence, if it is true that it is good for humans to cooperate as helpmates to one another in our meaning making, if it is true that we should love one another in conscious acts of mutual well-being, if it is true that these things are part of everyday ordinary events of life, if it is true that things, these things are not limited only to events that are explicitly religious, And if it is true that these realities make us human, and if it is true that the glory of God really is a human person fully alive, and if it is true that Jesus shows us what it means to have abundant life, then everything authentically human really is holy. And it's only when we fail to live up to the invitation to be who we were created to be that we fall into the realm of sin. Last statement I want to add to that. Our humanity is the playground on which we are saved and being a committed Episcopalian is one of the most human things we can do. So chew on that for a while. And thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Free will. Yes, his question was, what is the relationship between free will and the statement on here that none of us could have made it to this point alone? It's twofold. First of all, you exist because of God's grace. And in making you, you were given free will. Okay, so you're dependent upon God for your very existence. You're dependent upon God's grace for existence. Second of all, Back to my example, if when you were born somebody had put a diaper on you and left you and said, take care of yourself, you'd be dead. So you're depend- we are dependent upon God and we're dependent upon one another and I don't think that takes away our free will because God granted it to us at the very beginning at creation. But what it means is that one person with free will and another person with free will can freely cooperate. And love is the way Christ says to do that. A mutual commitment to one another's well-being. I'm committed to your well-being. You're committed to his well-being. And so we couldn't be here if it weren't for that. But I don't think it chips away at free will. Because you decide whether or not you want to love him. (laughs) And you can say, no, I don't care. I don't give a damn about your well-being. The opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. I don't care. 
I don't care whether you live or die. Does that help? Is that good? So I'm talking about the Christian model. Mm-hmm. I like that. Love it. Thank you. That's very profound. I hadn't thought about it quite that way, but I like it a lot. Are you going to write a book? If you do, I might buy one. <laughs> if you'll sign it. If you'll sign it for me, okay? Probably, your rear ends are probably tired. So if there is nothing else, thank you all. This has been fun. <laughs> My pleasure.